this is the lamp of prophecy channel on this channel we are going to be studying about bible prophecies and all the fundamental teachings of the bible this video is part one of the playlist called understand the book of daniel and revelation so in this video we are going to be studying of the purpose of the book of daniel and the meaning of the image of daniel too Stay tuned and watch to the end so that you don't miss anything about this amazing Bible prophecy. Also, you can subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you get notified about the new uploads of the channel. But before we start, let me first explain some important issues of why it is important to study Bible prophecies, as most churches ignore it and teach only the small things that people want to hear. Number one, we study Bible prophecies for a blessing and to be prepared for the soon coming of Jesus. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep the things, for the time is at hand. Number two, we study prophecies to know of the secrets that God revealed to his servants. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but to reveal his secrets unto his servants the prophets. Lastly, we study Bible prophecies because it's good and wholesome, as Bible prophecies are also part of the Bible itself. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and all good works. Even the Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now let us dive into this prophecy to understand its meaning and unlock of the deep things. The book of Daniel is the fifth and last major prophetic book in the Old Testament. It is recorded that its first chapters were written around 604 BC, approximately 600 years before Jesus' birth. The book was written by the prophet Daniel while he was in exile in Babylon and later in Persia. It was written through the eras of three kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar his son, and Darius the maid. Only chapter 4 was not written by Daniel but by Nebuchadnezzar the king. The book begins in troublous times because the people of Israel were taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar as a punishment from God for their rebellion. Babylonian armies destroyed Jerusalem and left it in ruins. After taking them to Babylon, the king ordered to look after some young men from the Israelites who were to be trained in the language and culture of the Chaldeans. Daniel and his, and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were given knowledge from God skill in learning and to Daniel understanding in all visions and dreams. Daniel lived until the first year of King Cyrus. In Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and sleep broke from him. The king commanded the magicians, astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell him what the dream was and its interpretation, for it is recorded that the king had forgotten his dream. But the dream troubled him as he knew that it was not an everyday dream. The magicians failed to answer the king's request, so the king was angry and furious to learn that these men could not do according to his expectations. The decree went forth that all wise men were to be killed for their failure, of which Daniel and his, and his three friends were part of them. Daniel asked the king's guard Ariak why the decree was so hasty, and Ariak made known to Daniel why. Daniel requested for time from the king. He and his friends prayed to God about the dream and God revealed it to Daniel in a night vision. Daniel thanked God who revealed the deep and secret things. Daniel went to Ariok, who took him to the king to tell him of his dream and its meaning. Daniel made known to the king about a God in heaven that revealed secrets. This was the account of all Daniel told the king. Thou, O king, sowest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, which were iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay and the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together, and become like the chaff of the summer, threading, threading flowers, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, 
and filled the whole earth. This is the account of what Daniel told the king about his dream. But what does it mean? Well, many people out there have tried their best to explain and interpret these prophecies, but for us, we have a foundation which says that the Bible and the Bible alone. God speaks to us through the Bible, and we must connect the dots, scripture to scripture, to know the interpretation of this prophecy. The intention of prophecy was not to threaten us. God did not give prophecy to make us fear, but God tells us of the future times to warn us and to direct us in the right path to make us be prepared for his second coming, for us to believe when prophecies do come to pass. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, ye might believe. Now let us look at the interpretation of this dream. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Daniel goes on to say, Thou, O king, art king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. Thou art this head of God. Daniel tells the king that this head of God was the king himself, King Nebuchadnezzar. He ruled over Babylon that had dominion from 605 BC to 539 BC. The kingdom of Babylon was the most glorious of all kingdoms, as even Nebuchadnezzar is called the king of kings. We must notice that this great image was consisting of meadows. The gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, iron and the clay. So, this head of gold, if it, if it represented Babylon, a kingdom, then the breast or the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, which we can call bronze, the legs of iron, the feet and toes of part iron and part clay, they are also soon coming, soon coming empires, which were also meant to rule the world. Which means that this great image was like, was like an arrangement of the kingdoms that will rule the world. This was a body that was showing the kingdoms that God has given dominion from that time to the end of the world, as we are going to see. So if the first meadow, the head of gold, is Babylon, then the other meadows are the soon to come kingdoms that were also meant to rule the world. Because Daniel says that, and after thee shall rise another kingdom. After Babylon was to rise another kingdom. So let us look at more evidence from the Bible that proves that Babylon is the head of gold, this head of gold. In the, in the book of Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 7, speaking he says, Babylon hath a golden cup in the Lord's hand. He says, Babylon hath a golden cup in the Lord's hand. So here also Babylon is portrayed as having, as having been connected to gold. Remember the head is golden. So he says, Babylon hath a golden cup in the Lord's hand. So from this, we are also told that Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. After the head of gold was the chest and arms of silver, which represented another empire that was ruled after Babylon. Take note of this, that for kingdoms to interchange, there must be overthrowing or conquering through battle. After Nebuchadnezzar died, his son Belshazzar succeeded him. An interesting fact is that Nebuchadnezzar knew the God of heaven, but his son Belshazzar did not. So in Daniel 5, Belshazzar the king made a great feast with his men, and he drank wine from the golden and silver vessels which his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem. In the feast, they drank and praised the gods of gold, silver, brass, iron, wood, and of stone. Suddenly a man's hand appeared and wrote on a wall, the writing of which they could not interpret. The king was troubled. His strength failed him and he was in shaking. The king called for the Chaldeans for to interpret the writing, but they could not. So the king was told of Daniel, who once had interpreted his father's dream. Then the king called for Daniel. When Daniel came in, he reminded the king of the acts of his father. He said, And thou his son of Belshazzar hast not humbled thine heart. Thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the God of heaven. Daniel told the king that the hand that had appeared was from God. And this is the writing that was written, Many, many, tekel ufashe. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom, and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Peres, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. 
due to Belshazzar's acts, Babylon was weighed in the balances of justice and found wanting. Therefore, God took the dominion from Babylonians and gave it to the Medes and the Persians. Now back to Daniel 2, we understood that the head of gold was the kingdom of Babylon. After Babylon, Daniel said that another kingdom would arise and would be inferior to thee. He says, and after thee shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that after you and your kingdom of Babylon, another kingdom shall rise which will, which will be lower than you, which shall be inferior to you. When we connect this to verse 5, sorry, when we connect this to Daniel chapter 5, we shall know that the inferior kingdom that was to rise after Babylon was the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians known as the Middle Persian Empire that ruled from 539 BC to 331 BC. In the night that Daniel interpreted the writing on the wall, that very night, the Bible records that in the night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Darius the maid took the kingdom, becoming being about three score and two years old. The Middle Persian Empire under Darius the Great conquered Babylon in 539 BC. This is the chest and arms of silver. To know who the belly and thighs of bronze is, then we must know who conquered Middle Persia. In the year 331 BC, Greek armies under, under Alexander the Great conquered the Middle Persian Empire after 280 years of its supremacy. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall rule, which shall bear rule over the world, would rise. So, uh, so for, that, for Daniel said that the head of gold is King Nebuchadnezzar, and after King Nebuchadnezzar shall rise another kingdom inferior to, to Babylon, the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar, and after it another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the world, would arise. The Greek Empire then. Uh, so the Greek Empire then is the third kingdom of brass of bronze, as represented on the on the image as the third medal. The supremacy of Greece went from 331 BC all the way to 168 BC. Who then was the legs of iron? In essence, who conquered Greece? In the year 168 BC, Greek supremacy came to an end after losing in battle. They lost their dominion to Rome, the Iron Empire. In verse 40 of Daniel 2, Daniel says that, And the fourth kingdom shall be, as str shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruises. The iron kingdom of Rome was the strongest and greatest empire in all human history. Remember he said that as iron breaketh in pieces all things, shall this kingdom break in pieces and bruises. Rome was the strongest, was the strongest and the greatest empire in all of human history. But remember, Babylon was the most glorious. That is why we said King Nebuchadnezzar was called the King of Kings. But here they tell us that Rome would be the greatest empire. Rome ruled from 168 BC to 476 AD for a period of 644 years. Who then conquered Rome? As we look to the image, there is no independent medal after iron, but ten toes of part iron and another part of, of clay. Rome then was not conquered but was divided because where, when, this, where, where, when the legs of iron go down, they divide into, two feet, into ten toes, meaning Rome was also divided. And there is enough evidence that Rome was divided. Rome then was not conquered but was divided, first into two parts, the Eastern Rome and Western Rome, and then into ten kingdoms or ten tribes. These are the ten toes on the image. Who then are these ten kingdoms or tribes? The Saxons today are the English, the Franks today are the French, the Alemanni today are the Germans, the Visigoths are the Spain, the Suevi today are the Portuguese, the Lombards are the Italians, the Bangadians are the Swiss, the Heruli, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths are now extinct. All these countries I've read are in Europe, meaning the kingdom of the, the, the Empire of Rome had its dominance in majorly Europe. Though these kingdoms were meant to rule over the world. But even we can see that the headquarters of this, of this kingdom were in Rome. 
Rome, which is in Italy, Italy, a European, a European nation, meaning that these ten toes, these ten toes, majorly focus on Europe, because these ten toes, we see these countries rise from Europe, or they are European countries. These countries in Europe, seven of these ten tribes still exist today, but of the reason why the three, the Vandals, the Ostrogoth, and the Heruli are extinct. Without no man of their descendants, without any man of their descendants today, we shall talk about that in time to come. But there is something unique about the fit era of this image. And whereas thou sowest, iron mixed with miracle, they shall mingle themselves with the seeds of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Let us look at the prophetic view of this. In this era, the era of the ten toes, we have two elements. We have clay and iron. In this, in this scenario, iron in the feed era represents Rome. But what about the clay? Because already the, 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 the feet of iron were of clay. Sorry, were of iron and represented the kingdom of Rome. So how, what about the clay? Clay is a symbol of the body in the Bible. Why? Because man's body was made out of the dust of the ground. The Hebrew word Moses uses to mean dust is the word afar, which when interpreted means clay. After God created the body, he breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Take note of this. Without the breath, man could not do anything. Man could not do anything, but at the breath being given to man, he became a life, a living soul. Now let us connect this with the words of Jesus. After his resurrection, Jesus was now said to go back to heaven. He commissioned his disciples that they should not depart from Jerusalem until they receive the promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now hear what Jesus says next. He says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses of me in both Jerusalem and all Samaria, and unto or ye shall be witnesses of me in both both in Jerusalem and all Samaria and unto the outermost parts of the earth. So now I want us to notice this, that the body of the church, of which Christ is the head, was already there with the small group of believers that Jesus had left. Remember Jesus said that, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So the body of the church was present by the time Jesus left, by this small group of the believers, the disciples and other followers of Jesus, who had been following him when he was alive and after his death and resurrection. But the body was lifeless because the church could not do anything at that moment. That is why they did not preach. In fact, Jesus told them that when you receive power, you shall be witnesses of me. Meaning that they could not do anything without receiving the power. The body was lifeless. The church could not do anything at that moment. So Jesus told them, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses in all the world. After the Holy Spirit came upon them, the body was now alive, as God had breathed in, in them the breath of life, the Holy Spirit. They went everywhere preaching the gospel and turning many from darkness. So, let us connect to this. In Genesis, God created man's body from dust, and this body was lifeless. But after breathing in it the breath of life, man became a living soul. He became alive to do what the, what what. He became alive to do what alive people do, to do what those who are living do. And also in, in the book of Acts, we see that there was the body. God had already made the body of the church of Christ. And remember, the Bible tells us that the church is the body of which Christ is the head. So God had already made the body, I've said that with this small group of believers. But the body was lifeless because it did not have the breath of life, the Holy Spirit. So when the breath of life came upon them, the Holy Spirit, they became alive and functional to preach the gospel, which Jesus had commissioned them to be his witnesses, to go and witness of him, to testify of, of his work that he had come to do on earth. So we conclude that the clay represents the early Christian church. 
In this fit era, we have said that the iron represents Rome, the, the clay represents the church. To you who have not understand again, I repeat this, that the, the clay represented the, represents the body of which was breathed in, in the breath of life and became living. The church became alive with the help of the Holy Spirit. As we have connected this with the other scenario of creation at Genesis, we conclude that the clay represents the early Christian church or the apostolic era, whereas iron represents Rome. The Bible tells us that the two will try to mix but will not, as iron does not mix with the clay. What does the Bible mean here? The Bible means that Rome, a pagan kingdom, would try to mix with the church, the church of God. So how did this exactly happen? How could the Christian church try to mix with the paganism of Rome? Failing in his attempt to destroy the Son of God, Satan turned his fury to the woman. The Christian church, the Christian church is the woman of Revelation chapter 12. We shall reach there in a time to come. All but one of Jesus' disciples died a martyr's death, and the apostle Paul was beheaded outside the walls of Rome. Christians were tortured, thrown into dungeons, dungeons, and most of them sealing their testimony with their blood. The church was firm in the times of the apostles, but when the third and second generation Christians came, there came compromise and apostasy among them. Toward the later end of the second century, most of the churches assumed a new form. The first simplicity disappeared as the old disciples as the old disciples retired to their graves. Ecclesiastical research, page 51. So in the first century, Emperor Constantine tried to mix or tried to pull the Roman Empire together by uniting pagans and Christians into one form of worship. As a result, Christianity lost much of its old stigma, in, in fact becoming very popular. Heathen people were baptized under the church and brought their pagan beliefs with them. One historian wrote that the new Christians were as far as thinking and habits went, the same old pagans. Their search into the churches did not wipe out paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptized paganism meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of Christianity to the point of impotence. Centuries of Christianity, a constant history, page 58. However, during this time, many Christians remained faithful to the teachings of Christ. Paganism started mingling or started smuggling into Christianity, e.g., the worship of idols, baptism of infants, using of candles, spiritualism that teaches that the dead don't die, and the greatest abomination of all, Sunday sacredness, instead of the Bible Sabbath. They tried to mix Christianity and paganism, but truth and error have never been together. So in, this is the application of, of the mixed iron and clay. The church mixed with Rome. In fact, this is where the birth of the Catholic Church came from. The church mixing with the Roman state. That is why it is called the Roman Catholic Church. The church, the apostolic church, mixed with the Roman state. And the, 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 the paganism of Rome if it was infiltrated, infiltrated the church. And But we know that truth and error have never been together. That's why the Bible told us that they try, they, they would try to mix with the seeds of men. With the, with the seeds of men. In fact, we should notice this. That the seeds of, the, the seed of men, or the sons of men, are those people who are not of God. The people who are of God are not, cannot be called the sons of men. We say they are called the sons of God. That is why the Bible tells us that, uh, speaking of Jesus, in the book of John chapter 1, he says that, And he gave them a right to become the sons of God, they that believed on his name. Whosoever believes in Christ become the sons of God, becomes a, sons of, a son of God. And who does not believe in Christ is a son to the world, is a seed of the world. So, the Bible tells us that, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom we shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever there is nothing else left on the image except the stone that crushes the image completely and becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth but let us first remind ourselves we say that the head of gold was the kingdom of babylon 
and the chest and arms of silver was the kingdom of Persia, of Middle Persia, and the belly and thighs of bronze was the kingdom of Greece. Then the legs of iron was Rome. Then the feet and toes of iron and the clay was the mixed pagani was the mixed church and 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 the state of Rome. In fact, this was the ruling power by then, the Roman Church Union. The Roman Church Union. That union the church had with Rome was the ruling state in that time. As we are going to learn of the many prophecies that were again revealed to Daniel, he talks more of these things in the next chapters. So, this, the Bible tells us that after this image, a stone comes and crushes it on its feet and crushes the whole statue the whole image completely this is stone the bible tells us that became a great mountain that filled the whole earth this will be the kingdom of god that god will establish at the end and this kingdom shall last forever the kingdom of the saints which we can call the new jerusalem this is not the end but of the beginnings of the many series of visions that daniel received but there is a god in heaven who reveals secrets and while you were sleeping, he showed you what will happen in the future. Your Majesty, what you saw standing in front of you was a huge and terrifying statue. This image, huge and dazzling, towered before you, fearful to behold. Its head was made of gold. Its chest and arms were silver. And from its waist down to its knees, it was bronze. From there to its ankles, it was iron, and its feet were a mixture of iron and clay. As you watched, a stone was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. The stone struck the feet, completely shattering the iron and clay, and swept away like chaff before the wind until no trace but the stone became a tremendous mountain that covered the entire earth. Was that really the dream? How would I know? And the meaning of the dream? Why does it fill me with dread? Because you, O oh King of Kings, you are that head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom, and then a third, and then a fourth, as strong as iron. During the time of those kings, the God who rules from heaven will set up an eternal kingdom that will never fall. 